Uh, today I will speak about uh, stochastic vector methods in electronic structure. We have a recently published annual review of physical chemistry on it, but uh, what I will present here would be more broad than, than the annual review. Um, so let me start with a bit of background and motivation. Uh, what we want to do in computational chemistry of large systems is to be able to predict or explain properties such as the nuclear structure or equivalently or similarly thermal properties like equations of state, heat conductivity, miscibility, things of this sort. Also electronic properties, conductivity, optical absorption, etc. And even if we could do some coherence lifetimes, things like that is also something that we could aim for. This is even more complicated than the others. Um, we want to, to talk about uh, events that are inside large systems. So sometimes we want to focus on a part of a very large system. This part interacts with the entire large system. So that's a challenge. Um, we want to use these type of approaches to do, to find new materials, to discover new drugs, and to do good things for humanity, of course. So all this is uh, our goal. Um, so if we go to large systems, we notice in physics that sometimes things become much simpler. Um, for example, so ho suppose you have some property A, which is extensive, it grows with the system size, like kinetic energy, total kinetic energy, total potential energy, things like that. Um, and uh, if you, if you measure it on, a, on one system uh, and it has some fluctuations due to, let's say, either because you're not computing it exactly or because there are thermal fluctuations, whatever, there's some fluctuations in your knowledge. So the relative fluctuation is the uh, standard deviation divided by the value of A. And if you now take N such systems and you measure on N systems, they're independent, then actually your value is n times a1. And the variance also grows by a factor of n, according to statistics theory, because these are independent systems. And then the relative fluctuation actually goes down like the square root of n. So the more you add to systems you look at, the fluctuations go to zero as you increase this. This is well known. It's why statistical mechanics works. And um, that's why when we are in this room and we see each other, we don't see any fluctuations. We see uh, very sharp quantities. So this is a property of physical systems. Even when they are not entirely independent, these systems that you put together, because usually they interact with finite, um, finite extent, as the systems grow, you can still use this to, to reason why the fluctuations decay to zero. So this is quite general statement. Uh, also, we have another thing we should notice that the hotter simpler systems become, that means the higher the temperature, the more classical they become and the more localized they become. So this is another simplification you can see in some limit of large systems if you increase the temperature. But our best method, arguably best method, but I think it's one of the methods of choice for large systems, maybe the most reliable today, is the Konsham approach, which basically tells you that you have to solve the Konsham, you have to map your system into non-interacting electrons and then solve in the non-interacting Hamiltonian, for which we have a simple recipe to build effect, uh, good Hamiltonians, which are reasonably accurate in many cases. We have to solve the Konsham equations and then get the density. But you can already see that uh, the larger the system, the harder we have to work. We have to solve 
as, as we have more electrons, we have to occupy more uh, uh, electronic orbitals, and therefore we need to solve more eigenstates of this Hamiltonian, and we have to sum them up into the density. Uh, usually, if you're at zero temperature, you need uh, the number of electrons over two number of orbitals. These are the occupied orbitals. So the bigger the system, the more complicated. Here's another example. Uh, this is an example of bi-exciton generation. So it's a very simple model that we built some time ago. Um, the idea is that when you create an exciton, there's a hole and an electron in the, in the conduction band. Uh, this all, uh, hole and electron, they decay very quickly to the band gap. And so you lose a lot of energy. And there was a fantasy sometime in the 10 or 15 years ago, that maybe in nanocrystals, you can use an alternative approach. Instead of losing everything to heat, you might have one of those charge carriers, uh, let's say uh, this hole, decay very fast to the bandage and create, or decay a bit to the bandage and create another electron hole pair. And then you have two, two electron hole pairs, so you don't lose all the energy to heat. You can use this for solar cell energy or whatever. Um, and you want to calculate the rate that this process goes by and compare it to the rate that this process goes. And hopefully, this rate would be faster. Um, and we made a very simplistic calculation here. But even that turned out to be quite difficult because of the number of states that you have to include when you do for large systems. Again, this is in a nanocrystal. So, for example, in, uh, in nanorods, cadmium selenium nanorods, with uh, 20,000 atoms, uh, we needed to, to consider 10 to the power of 10 states, which is uh, huge. And, and uh, uh, that's another example where, as systems grow, you need, in our usual way we think of electronic structure, you have to work very, very hard. Also, uh, the Concham theory, when, uh, when systems become hotter, they don't simplify, they actually become more complicated. And that is because once you have temperature, you need to occupy the states according to the Fermi Dirac distribution, which is this brown line. So you get, these are the occupied states at zero temperature, but once the temperature is not, is far from zero, you also need to include, occupy excited states, and there are many, many of them, much more than the occupied states. In large systems, this is very dense manifolds often. And again, once temperature grows, you need to work much harder to get a density functional theory calculation, uh, a finite temperature density functional calculation. And uh, it's, we all know that, um, or there is a feeling that if systems are like condensed matter systems, which are more or less homogeneous, uh, it's, it feels silly to sum up all these orbitals. For example, in this very simple model that we teach uh, undergraduates, chronic penny model, you have a Hamiltonian, which includes two sites interacting with some uh, coupling. You get two bands, the valence and conduction bands. And if you look at the eigenstates, this is the lowest eigenstate. So it's very similar to the eigenstates of particle in a box. No nodes. Here you have two nodes. Here you have um, five nodes, etc. And you can see that at lower energy, each eigenstate is very different from the other. But as the energy grow, as an n grows, they start becoming very similar. And it's very difficult to, for example, to differentiate between n equals 18 and n equals 20. Yeah? They're almost the same. There's a small shift. So, so why do we have to calculate all these states which look so similar? Maybe there's a way, another way. So my question is, can we uh, develop a method that actually goes to this physical uh, physical limit that things become simpler when systems grow, at least when they are simple homogeneous systems. Okay, that we don't have to work so hard as system grows or system becomes hotter. Is there a way to, to do the calculation that goes naturally to this physically, physical uh, property of systems? 
And of course, I wouldn't be asking if I wouldn't suggest something that the answer is yes. And the idea is to use a statistical approach so that uh, we're actually, we don't start doing all the orbitals, but just sample them. This is the main idea. And uh, then we can uh, do some calculations in, for ground state, for uh, excited state, or for thermal state, and which usually require dealing with huge amount of orbitals. Maybe we can do them much easier. And um, let me just remind you a background of a statistical theory. So the whole idea of using statistical theory is that you're going to sample so you need the concept of a random variable that, has, that is distributed in some way, p of r. p has to be normalized to 1. And you can calculate the, and you can define an expected value for this variable, which is just the weighted sum of the values. And uh, if you have a function of the value, also you can use the same type of formula to get the expected value of f of r. f of r is also a random variable. And uh, and you can calculate it. it. Maybe its distribution is difficult, but it's to calculate. But its expected value is e easy to calculate if you know p of r. And the same for uh, the variance of r. You can calculate the expected value of r minus the expected value squared. So all this we know. Um, we also know that the variance or the uh, or the standard uh, distribution is a measure of how far the actual sample values are from the, from the expected value when you sample. And uh, it turns out that you have even a limit, Chebyshev limit. Uh, even as long as you have a variance, then this is the worst case scenario. But usually, in many cases, you can do much better. That means your samples will be much closer to the correct value, to the um, to the uh, expected value than the worst case. But even the worst case shows that once you go five, uh, 10 times or 5 times uh, from the, uh, of the standard deviation, the, uh, there's a high probability your samples will fall near the expected value. I'm saying this because I'm going to turn our calculation into a sampling process, and we need to be able to estimate the errors. So, and this is also well known when you, if you do a measurement, which if you do I measurements, so you have I samples, you can calculate the sample average, it's a sample mean, and that will be an estimate for the expected value. And the sample standard deviation will allow us to, to obtain a, a, um, a uh, uh, error bound for our estimate. So if we made just one sample, we have the whole error bar, S. But if we make 16 samples, then the error bars go down by a factor of square root of 16, which is 4. So, so the more we sample, the more close our estimate of the expected value is going to be uh, using the average, the mean is going to be. So. Uh, this points the way to how we're going to do the calculation. We're going to sample, calculate, and we're going to set things up so that our, whatever we want to calculate is the expected value of a process. And then we'll sample and get the mean and, and find the expected value. Now, there's two types of errors. One of them is just a fluctuation. So if you increase the number of samples, you can see that the, that the spread of your, uh, here I made, let's say, I don't even remember how many, but let's say 50 samples, so they spread with some, some width, but as you increase, uh, then you can do two samples and, and average on two, on pairs, so 50 times two, and the more you do samples, the smaller the, the error bars become. But you can see that the averages are always quite close to zero, so they're flat. But there is a different type of error, which is called a bias. The bias error always also goes to zero when you sample more, but, it, but you can see the difference here. When you, sample, when you have a small number of samples, the bias is large. No matter how many times I redo this, 
if every time I have just one sample, I will have, if I try to, to estimate, let's say, the expected value squared, I will have an error. So since we're going to do some estimation of, of uh, functions which are nonlinear, we will always have a bias. So we have to know how to define it and to find it. OK, so the idea that we're going to, the machinery we're going to use is the concept of a vector, of a column, of a vector of independent, vari uh, of independent random variables. So we call this a stochastic vector. All the elements here are random variables, and they all have an absolute value of 1. So that means that if they're real, they can be either plus or minus 1. Or if they're complex, they are on the unit circle in the complex plane. Uh, you can choose which you want. There's also other choices, by the way, we experimented with. But here I will only discuss these two. Uh, we choose the, the, if it's 1 or minus 1 uh, with equal probability, so the expected value of each element is 0. And for a product of two of them, it's going to be 0 if k and k prime is, are different, but it's going to be because of this, it's going to be 1 when k and k prime are equal. So this is just the definition of the unit matrix. So I can write this as the unit matrix, or in quantum mechanical operator form, if chi is this column vector, we say that the projection on chi is the unit matrix. If you if you sample it infinite a number of times and do an average, you get the unit matrix. So this is the basic idea. And uh, the way to use this, for example, is when, but it's not the only way. I'm going to show some other creative ways. But uh, the most basic way is if you need to trace something, that means calculate the uh, diagonal values of a matrix in some basis then you can either do the trace directly. That will cost you k cubed operations if the matrix is, um, if the operator, you cannot apply it in a fast way. Or k squared operations if you can apply it in a fast way, in a linear scaling way. However, um, you can also do a stochastic trace. That means calculate the expected value of A under a stochastic vector and then average this R, this, this uh, expected value, and the average and the expected value of this operation is expected to be the trace of A. So if you're willing to have some fluctuation in your result, this, you can use this idea. And then, and then maybe you will not be um, dependent on the size of, this, of, this, of, the, of the basis of your system. So if uh, and then, and this will be this trace will be linear scaling, unlike the the exact trace, which is at best you can get is uh, quadratic scaling. So that's the basic idea of this approach, and we can actually show that uh, for ex uh, extensive quantities where the operator you're tracing is diagonally dominant, then the larger the system, the less you have to work. So you might be afraid that the larger the system, I still have to work more and more to get the trace. Actually, it's the opposite. Uh, for many cases, many physically relevant operators, they are di diagonal dominant or nearly so. And then the bigger the system, actually, the better the trace formula works. So, so this, is, this you can prove mathematically. Uh, also, if your, your operators are local in your basis, that means let's say far from a given point there's zero, then also the trace formula will be uh, linear scaling. Now, how do we use it in, in Concham DFT? So in Concham DFT, you need to get, you have a Hamiltonian and you want to get the density, but you don't want to, to go through the Concham eigenstates. You don't want to diagonalize to find eigenvalues or eigenvectors. So, so formally, if you did that, you would have to take the eigenvector, the eigenfunction psi k, square it, multiply it by the population, let's say Fermi-Dirac population. Here I talk about the square root of Fermi-Dirac, so you put it inside this, the brackets, and you sum over all the eigenstates in the system. This gives you the density. 
Okay, so that's a typical calculation in Consham theory. Um, but in our case, okay, if we, uh, we usually use a grid of points and represent the wave functions on a grid, so it's actually vectors with grid points. So the previous expression becomes this sum, and uh, the, the vectors are just these, uh, represent the eigenfunctions. And I can write this sum as a trace in this way. So I, I define a operator f, which is the square root of the Fermi-Dirac function of the Hamiltonian. And I put it here and here, so it comes twice, so the square root goes away. And uh, this is the density at point r. I trace that, I get the average value of the density at point rg, times 2 because of spin. And so I just wrote the density without, wave, without the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Instead, I have this function of the Hamiltonian that I have to, to represent and to operate on, on, on a basis. Right? Yes. Okay. So you said you, you sample points on a grid. How many points do you typically have in your calculation? Or what is the rate? Typical, it depends on the system size, but let's say 10 million for a big system or something like that. Yeah. But it depends on the system size. But the number of grid points is proportional to, your, to the volume of your system, more or less. Yeah. So, so that's important to know. OK, so once we have a trace, we can just create out of it a trace formula. And actually, what we need to do is to calculate these functions, square them, and then take the expected value. These functions are the operation of f on a random vector, on a, a stochastic vector. So we take this f, operate on a stochastic vector. The result is squared at each point g. And then you have the density. That's all you need to do. Of course, you can even do it with just one, one function, but then you will have a big... So this is an issue of sampling already. How do I estimate this expected value? I can estimate it by doing just one orbital. That shouldn't give you a very stupid answer, by the way. It usually will give even... Even just one orbital will give something that is reasonable. But if you want much less noise, and you do, you typically have to do 10 or 100 or uh, stochastic orbitals, and then you get r relatively good or uh, uh, good fluctuations. Okay, so this is much better than doing calculating all the Consham states. It's much more uh, efficient. Ah, one more thing. Um, how do we operate with these uh, functions of the Hamiltonian on chi? This we use Chebyshev expansions of functions of a variable. H, the Hamilton Hamiltonian, is the variable. So that means that this function becomes a power series in, of some sort, that we have to repeatedly operate with the Hamiltonian. And the number of terms in that uh, expansion depends on the temperature, actually, on this beta. So if you want target zero temperature, beta typically has to be quite big on the size of hundreds of atomic units. And then you need thousands, typically thousands, of Hamiltonian operations. If you are in warm dense matter or uh, like, let's say, 50,000 Kelvin, then, then you only need a few hundred of Hamiltonian operations. Yes. I'm not sure to understand. So chi here is, are the random variables? Yeah, chi is a random vector. So it's a vector that is, let's say, 1 or minus 1 on each grid point. What is the law? The? The probabilistic law of each random variable? The po probabilistic. So on each grid point, I put 1 or minus 1 with equal probability. Probability. Yes. So it's, it's a very stupid function on the grid. No information in it, basically. But once you operate with f, then you, you get the density, uh, an estimate for the density. And if you do it for two functions, you get a better estimate, etc. OK? So that's the basic idea. Yeah? More technical question. So um, an alternative that some people recommend is to do stochastic Langshaw. So if the expansion is adapted to the 
random vector you're applying it to. Do you guys ever try that? I haven't tried Langchos, but Langchos is probably very similar to Chebyshev. Yeah, it's very similar. It's just yes. the expansion coefficients now have a dependence on the initial pi. On the initial pi uh, you apply to. Yeah, so I will briefly touch on, on the fact that actually the fact that Chebyshev does not depend on chi at all, you can use it to do at the same effort several expansions at once. So for example, if you calculate not only the density, but let's say also the entropy or the, the orbital energy or anything which depends on H, only on H, then actually you can get very economical way of, with Chebyshev you can get a very fast way of estimating everything once you do uh, the density. Ah, here it, actually here is one of the tricks that we use that makes use of what I just said. So we can reduce the, the, frag, the uh, uh, stochastic errors, the fluctuation errors by, by using what we call embedded fragments. So we take the big system, make out of it a set of smaller systems, each small system is something we can easily do a DFT for, and then we do a DFT on each small system, and then we use, we do it twice, once a, a real DFT, a regular DFT, deterministic, and the second time a stochastic with the same, same random numbers we used for the big system, and then the difference between the deterministic value and the stochastic value for each fragment is used as a correction term for the stochastic DFT calculation. And that reduces significantly the errors, uh, the, the variance of the stochastic calculation. And you can show that what you're actually doing is trying to correct over the sum, the stupid sum of, of the different systems the stochastic process only corrects for the difference between the sum and the real system and not, not, uh, not doing everything stochastically. So that improves the calculation a lot. Another trick, which is more recent, is to divide the Fermi-Dirac, this is the energy, this is the Fermi-Dirac function up to here, but we create more Fermi-Dirac functions inside the occupied space and each of them, and the difference between each two is actually a window, an energy window. And we, because we can do with one Chebyshev expansion all these windows, we can actually take the stochastic orbital and divide it into contributions from each energy range separately, and then add up the results. And the, mathematically, you get, you get an exact trace. There's no approximation here, but the, it turns out that when you calculate some observables like forces, this reduces significantly the error bars. Here is an example of a force calculation on silicon, on silicon 512. Uh, if you don't do the trick, then the force um, uh, standard deviation is around one electron volt per angstrom, but when you do this uh, energy windows, this blue line is, I think, uh, 100 windows. And as I said, 100 windows to calculate them is the same as almost the same numerical work as calculating one window. Uh, you reduce the error bars by a large fraction with almost no work. This is for forces. OK, another thing. Um, OK, if I'm talking about forces, why do we need forces on the atoms? That is to, to, to sample their uh, 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 Boltzmann distribution. So one of the ways to do it is using Langevin dynamics. And basically, um, each of our produced forces has three components that we can think of. One is the correct force, which we do not know because we don't do a deterministic calculation. One is the fluctuation due to the DFT process, eta. And then we add another fluctuation. You'll see in a minute why. So there's three, three terms here. We only know the sum of the first two, and xi we, we know because we add it. And um, so eta is the unknown fluctuation part. F bar is the unknown deterministic part. But their sum is known. And then xi is another uh, white noise, 
which we add so that the total white noise in this problem has a covariance which is a constant times the unit matrix. So this is a trick uh, which was, I saw it in a paper of uh, Sorella about uh, 12 years ago. You add white noise and you get a very simple covariance matrix. Um, and then you just solve the Newton equation with friction and the friction has to obey the fluctuation dissipation relation and then you are actually simulating or sampling the Boltzmann distribution with kinetic energy T. And even though your forces are not accurate, your sampling is sampling the Boltzmann distribution accurately. Provide you make sure that your friction obeys this equation. Uh, in practice, we do a bit more sophisticated algorithm. I won't go into it. And the fluctuation dissipation relation becomes this. So gamma, the friction coefficient, has to solve this equation for each atom. Uh, here is an example of using this approach for large systems. So we calculated the um, pair distribution function of bond lengths in silicon in large silicon system, this is a silicon nanocrystal with hydrogen on the outside, uh, on the surface of it's a more or less spherical system, and uh, we get the initial the initial uh, configuration by just cutting it out from uh, bulk, and then using the Langevin dynamics, we let it um, we let it relax. We use two temperatures. There's the blue line, which is three, 30 K. Red line is 300K for the nuclei. And you can see that uh, the blue lines are much sharper, the red lines are much broader. And here you can also see the dynamics of the relaxation. So the black thin line here is the initial uh, uh, nearest neighbor distance that we cut out from the bulk. So it's almost, it has, it has no uh, distribution. No width, this is almost zero width. And then as we do the, the, because we have temperature, actually the width grows and also the expected value grows a bit uh, of, the, of the nearest neighbor interactions. This is um, for silicon 700 and this is silicon 147. So that's, that was an example of how we can use our approach with, uh, to determine um, properties of, or structural properties of large systems. I want to also talk about, I said, as systems get hotter, things should become simpler. So this is an example. Here is a calculation time, total CPU wall time, when you do a regular Consham calculation using, I think, quantum espresso. So as the temperature grows, you have to work harder because you have to create more um, more eigen, uh, consham eigenstates. But our approach actually, as the temperature grows, becomes uh, easier to do because beta grows, uh, beta uh, gets smaller, beta is the inverse temperature, and as beta gets smaller, our Chebyshev expansions get smaller. So we actually have to work less. And so this method of stochastic DFT is especially suited for warm dense matter or uh, calculations. The higher the temperature, the easier calculations. Here, there's a caveat that ca is not impossible to overcome. Um, we don't treat the core electrons. We have pseudopotential, so we cannot go to temperatures too high. Otherwise, we won't be able to describe correctly the core, core excitations. Uh, in principle, you can include also cores, but then our, the calculation becomes much more expensive because the other part of beta becoming bigger is the energy range of the Hamiltonian. So we need to keep the energy of the Hamiltonian not big, otherwise our Chebyshev expansion length grows very much. So, but for warm dense matter up to, let's say, 100,000 Kelvin, this should not be a big problem. Beyond that, it might. Here's an example of, of a crude equation of state calculation. So we have the, the this is for silicon at 20,000 Kelvin. We have um, density, and this is the free energy of the electrons. The nuclei are static, and you can, and uh, we made many calculations. It's time with a different random number generator. 
uh, seed. So you can see there's, there, you get many parabolas of this sort. They're all different, so there's a very big uh, fluctuation in the total free energy, but you can see that these lines are quite parallel. And in fact, if you calculate from this by differentiation of each of the lines, the pressure, the pressure has a much smaller noticeable um, error. You can still see that this line is very thick because there's many lines lying one on top of each other and they're not identical lines. So, but this is a useful pressure versus density. And even if you take the second derivative to get the bulk modulus, you still have a very nice uh, behavior. So even though the free energy is, has a big fluctuation, not very big, if you look at the relative, it's only, it's, it's less than, it's like 0.2%, so it's quite small. Once you take the derivatives, it looks like it's, you get useful information on the, on the pressure. This is pressured uh, due to the electrons, yeah. Um, Another thing that uh, is important in warm dense matter and also in zero temperature is the conductivity. So you can do conductivity with time dependent DFT, that's the correct way to do it, but there is also an approximation called the Kubo Greenwood conductivity, which assumes that the electrons are non interacting throughout. And then again, the expression of, the, of Kubo Greenwood could be written as a trace of a time dependent quantity, which you can then do a Fourier transform and get the conductivity. So, because it's a trace, then again, all you need to do is to get a stochastic orbital, C, the, a chi, operate with, okay, you see all these operators here. This is momentum. Momentum as a function of t, it's a Heisenberg momentum, so you have to also do an evolution operator, so you have, you take a stochastic orbital, this minus one, one, minus one, one, everywhere, you operate with a Fermi Dirac, which is, which is a, a function of the Hamiltonian, then with the evolution operator, again a function of the Hamiltonian, and then with the momentum, and on the other side, with the same chi, you do a different operator, so basically it's, we, took those two, and when you put them together and take the, uh, the overlap between these two functions that you get C and eta, and you, you will get the, um, the conductivity or the correlation function. Then you can Fourier transform it and get the conductivity or whatever you're looking for. So the procedure, again, involves no eigenstates. The original Kubo greenwood formula involves all the eigenstates of the problems. You have to go to the unoccupied eigenstates and to the occupied and look at electron hole uh, pairs, etc. So here you don't have to do it. It comes out. And this is an example uh, of, of the calculation for hydrogen 256 at 4000 Kelvin. So this is a benchmark. Uh, we did the deterministic and the stochastic and we can show that we can get very good agreement between the two. Also here I give uh, a result from a paper by the group of Ronald Redmer of the same system but using GGA, we're using LDA, uh, and you can see this is our result, the blue line, and the result is this red line. They, they go to zero beyond some energy because they stopped calculating the eigenstates, so they cannot look at electron hole pairs beyond the a given photon energy. Because we're just doing sampling of everything, of the entire electronic space, then we can go to the entire spectrum. And then we use this approach to study mixtures of helium and hydrogen. Um, how much time do I have, Mr. Garnett? <laughs> Okay, I'll look. I thought you were sitting with the clock and waiting to stop me. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. So maybe I will jump over this. These results are uh, maybe maybe important for people who are studying these systems. But here I'm just using it as an example of uh, of the method more than the physics. So we change the mixtures between helium and hydrogen, and you can see that when the system in this mixture when the system is, is mainly hydrogen, it's a conductor, so the, most of the conductance is done 
at zero uh, is DC. And when you have helium, most of the conductance, there's a peak somewhere in between, around 30 electron volts, which is close to the ionization energy or above the ionization energy of helium. And, and if you look at mixture like this yellow thing, half and half, then you have some mixture between the two uh, spectra. What, what pressures are these? Uh, pressures, I cannot tell you because I don't, we didn't uh, calculate the pressure. I can tell you the density and the temperature. But uh, I don't have, I, this is before, now we're working on doing a full uh, Langevin dynamics calculation from which we can give the, the pressure and temperature. Here, this is done on a system that we used a f uh, force field to get the structure the nuclear structure, and this is only electronic calculation. So I don't know the pressure, but I do know the density. It's very high pressure, I assume, but I don't know <laughs> exactly. Um, and so uh, here you can see the density of states. So there's a lot of states involved for this system, even though it's not very huge systems. You have only 1,000 electrons or 1,500 electrons. Um, we can see a transition between uh, conductor and non-conductor in some way we defined it, but I won't go through it. Okay, what I want to use the next few minutes is to show you that not only DFT can be improved, uh, there's also much more complicated calculations like many body perturbation theory. So we focus on G0, W0. We also have a lot of work on, on a very similar but different approach called GF2, which is more like a perturbation theory over artery fog. This is a perturbation theory over um, DFT. So basically, this approach is, turns out to give good results, even though it has a lot of approximations built into it. Good results when it's done over a good starting point uh, Concham starting point. So I'm going to write the theory. The theory tries to take a Concham eigenvalue epsilon and improve and make out of it a quasi-particle energy by adding a correction. So what is a correction? There's a polarization self-energy and an exchange self-energy that you add and then you subtract the, the expected value of Vxc. But I'm writing it here in a way that most G, GW specialists won't see immediately that it's a valid form. I write it for any epsilon. That's because we're talking about big systems. The eigenvalues are almost continuous. So I, I treat epsilon as a continuous value, a variable. And then, and then uh, I represent expectation values as a trace with a Gauss, very narrow Gaussian function of the Hamiltonian around epsilon. So this is instead of doing an expected value, we're doing a trace with a, with a narrow operator. Um, and so basically, um, this operator is again a Chebyshev series. This trace we do with a stochastic trace. And the main issue I will talk about is how to evaluate this term, which is also the, the most difficult part in a GW calculation. This is the screened, uh, th this is the, what is called uh, polarization self-energy or the screened self-energy. It has to do with the fact that the uh, interaction between the quasi-particle and the electrons are screened by the electrons of the system. So uh, in GW theory, this is the, expect this is the expression for this uh, self-energy. It's G0, it's the Green's function of the non-interacting Concham system, and W0 is a screen potential built upon the non-interaction system. I will talk about this in a minute. And again, I'm evaluating it using a trace with this function that makes sure that we are in a narrow band of, eig of Concham eigenstates near energy epsilon. That's instead of doing a expected value between two eigenstates that is usual. Again, because we're in a very dense 
uh, manifold of, of eigenvalues. Uh, there's no point in talking about just one eigenstate. We actually average over a group of eigenstates which are almost uh, degenerate in energy. This is what this trace does. This Q is just uh, some uh, normalization constant. And then G0 is the usual uh, time, time ordered expression, which depends if time is positive, you get one result. If time is negative, you get another. And also it depends if your energy of your state is above the chemical potential or below. So this is ca kind of a strange function, but it always appears in Green function theory standard. I won't go into it too much. All we need to know is that G0 is a function of the Hamiltonian for every time t. That's all we need to know to apply the theory. So we have a Chebyshev expansion with different times, but it's always the same expansion, only the coefficients differ because they depend on time. This screen potential is the part which causes much of the problem. So it usually, uh, it's very nicely explained in Matuk's book. You have, if you have a horse and the horse is riding on sand, you cannot just treat the bare horse. Uh, you have to treat the quasi horse, which is the horse plus the dust it excites together with, with it. So this is a quasi horse or a quasi particle. And that causes the interactions to be screened because electrons, all the electrons in the systems are reacting to the hole that you are creating in the system. Either they're attracted to the hole or repelled from the electron that you added to the system. And this is what this expression tries to, to uh, write down. So suppose you have some perturbation in the density. Uh, if you multiply by the Coulomb interaction, you get a, a, a uh, potential. Then you take the system response to this potential. It gives you another density. And then it gives you another, um, yeah, another density. You multiply by UC, you get another potential. So by the time you get to the second UC, you are in a screen potential. And then you look at it at R2, at a different point. So this density perturbation at R1 created a potential at R2 far away by this expression. So that's, so this is quite complicated to calculate and we'll see how everything fits together. So the entire self-energy, we write it in the time domain. Afterwards, we can always do a Fourier transform to get it into the uh, energy domain. So it includes this expected value. You have W0, G0 here, and you have phi is a stochastic vector. You have phi here, and here phi epsilon is just phi, which we operated with a filter. So this you need to calculate for each phi. Let's say you have only one, you do just one calculation like that. If you have 10, you have to average on 10, etc. The more you average, the better the, this result becomes. Now, what's, how do you evaluate these operators? So G0 is evaluated using two stochastic orbitals. So there's one here, stochastic orbital, Another one here, the second one, zeta. Zeta prime is just g operating on zeta gives zeta prime. So this operator can be written as an expected value of this expression. And the last one, this w0, is the more difficult one. Uh, we stick it together with equation 12 into the expression of sigma. So you get a very complicated looking expression. There's phi from the first stochastic orbital after it's been filtered. Then you have zeta prime, it's a function of t. On the right side, you have zeta and phi not unperturbed, so these are the original stochastic orbitals. And here you have this w0 now, okay? And the big problem in doing this calculation as it stands is that here you have t and t. And actually, as I told you, we can, if there weren't two t's in this expression, we could use the Chebyshev trick of with one expansion doing all t's together, but they, are, but they appear in two different places, so we cannot really do it. And so the, what we do is we introduce a third stochastic orbital, stochastic vector, here, just in between this and this. And this allows us to have two numbers instead of, orbit, instead of uh, operators, we have numbers. Here there's one number, and here there's another number. 
and we can calculate this separately as a function of t, this separately as a function of t, and then multiply the two numbers, and we get the and average if we want to do many calculations and average, and get sigma. And so the only thing left to calculate is is this quantity with three stochastic orbitals, C, zeta, and phi. And this we do with TDDFT or TD Hartree, depending on which method we want to do, use. So we, so this zeta phi, this random product, or this product of two random orbitals, uh, is considered as a density perturbation multiplied by UC. It becomes a potential perturbation. Then chi, using TDDFT or TD Hartree, converts the potential fluctuation delta v into a density fluctuation, delta n. And then uc operates on delta n, so it creates the, poten the Coulomb potential of this density perturbation. And this is then evaluated with xi. And that uh, finishes this thing. So we had to use three sets of stochastic orbitals, phi, xi, and zeta. And that allows us to break up. So there's several tricks here, like representing an operator with a pair, breaking up an expression into two parts, and also using the trace formula. Um, this is the most elaborate uh, calculation or tricks that we have used. And uh, I see the chairman standing up just to tell you we tested our method on small molecules where we can compare to, to turbo, uh, turbo, how is it called, turbomol, turbomol, uh, and we get essentially the same result. So the method really works, it's not just on paper. And also we, we uh, calculated it for very large systems reaching thousands of electrons. Here we can look at the quasi-particle. This is the whole energy, this is the electron energy, highest whole energy, lowest electron energy. And we can see that the, in silicon at least, the holes, they become degenerate already at around 1,500 electrons, but the electron energy keeps going down. So basically, it's still system size dependent here. Of course, uh, we know that for silicon, it will stop being system size dependent only when the gap is one electron volt. So there's still a way to go. 3000 is still a small system for this, for electron localization in silicon. Okay, I finished. Just uh, to, to remind you what we said. I said the motivation was to find methods that when systems grow and become harder, the method itself becomes easier to, to apply, unlike our usual approaches in density functional theory. I showed that you need to combine Chebyshev expansion methods and stochastic trace and stochastic sampling to allow DFT calculations and GW calculations. And um, the main field that we see right now for, for this type of approaches is really to study WDM, warm dense matter, uh, systems where the DFT really becomes much easier than the deterministic calculation. So we are now in an ongoing project that has only begun now because of COVID. It took about a year to start um, and to study how good this our approach will be for WDM. With this, I finish. I should just like to point out that we by now this uh, approach uh, we've been developing it for almost ten years. So there are many people who contributed, um, students, this is in my group, and the entire work is in collaboration with Iran Rabani's group in Berkeley and Daniel Newhouse's group in UCLA. So there are many people contributing from there. Uh, Wojtek Vlacek is a big contributor. He was my PhD student and then went and did postdoc with Daniel Newhouser. Today he's in UC Santa Barbara. We also have collaborations with Dominica's Guide and Ronald Redmer. So by this I finish. <laughs>